Good evening, and welcome to the first event of the Fall 2022 Strathmore Speakers Series. Our guest tonight is Syracuse University College of Law Professor Jenny Breen, who will be discussing the impact of the Supreme Court's recent rulings on American politics and democracy. Looking beyond the well-publicized verdict in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, Professor Breen will provide analysis of several of the court's lesser known yet equally consequential rulings. Upcoming cases, including the deeply significant Moore v. Harper, will also be addressed. A brief Q&A will follow President, uh, Professor Breen's talk, so please stick around for that. Jenny Breen teaches constitutional law, administrative law, and labor law at SU. Our interdisciplinary scholarship is centrally concerned with democratic governance in the United States and pays particular attention to the role of gender and labor politics. Our current research examines the Supreme Court's relationship to democratic erosion in the United States. She's also written in the areas of immigration and criminal law. Her writing has appeared or is forthcoming in journals, including the Berkeley Journal of Employment and Labor Law, the University of Hawaii Law Review, the American Criminal Law Review, and the Journal of Policy History. She received her JD from Cornell Law School and her PhD in political science from the University of Pennsylvania. And now, please welcome Professor Jenny Breen. Okay. okay, thank you all for having me here tonight. I'm really honored to have been asked to be here with everyone to discuss what is a very important topic in our politics right now. Um, so there are many ways to frame a discussion about the Supreme Court. We could talk about specific areas of law, religious freedom cases, or election law, or we could talk about how the votes break down in individual cases and across the term, who's voting with who, are they Republicans or Democrats? Um, and certainly some of those things will come up today. But I want our focus for the our thinking and conversation to, today to be on democracy and specifically what role the Supreme Court is and should be playing when it comes to preserving our form of democratic governance in the United States. So my plan today is to spend a few minutes up front establishing the stakes of the present political moment. And specifically, I'm going to be arguing that American democracy is in a moment of some peril right now, and that unfortunately we're not alone in the world in this regard. Then I'm going to talk about three cases from the most recent Supreme Court term, and as I do so, I'm going to be considering the ways in which the court's decisions impacted democracy in the United States, and I hope you'll be doing the same with me as, a, as I walk through those cases. And then finally, I'm going to talk very briefly about four cases on the docket for the coming term. I'm going to give a brief overview of each of those cases and pose some questions about the possible impact of each case on democratic governance in the United States. Um, one note before we begin, you will notice that, for example, Dobbs and New York Rifle do not appear on this list, and that's because I've been asked to talk about more under-the-radar cases. So that's going to be the focus for the conversation this evening, though, of course, we can discuss other cases in the Q&A if you'd like. So let's get started by talking about democracy here and around the world um, before we start talking about specific cases. We heard President Biden talk about threats to American democracy in his speech last week, but in reality, American democracy has been on the radar of scholars of democracy for a while now, and that's because we appear to be a country that is moving away from a commitment to democratic governance. And unfortunately, we are part of a global trend in that regard. Like many other countries around the world at this moment in time, we're facing serious threats to democratic stability in the United States. Um, you see here a chart from the VDEM Institute, which is an organization that is physically located in Sweden, but is in reality staffed by scholars, thousands of scholars from all around the world that assess countries on more than 350 indicators of democracy, and they publish annual reports and other writings about the state of democracy um, globally. The first chart that you see up here is from the 2017 report and shows us that the United States is marked as a stable liberal democracy. And you can see I have a little red dash next to it in the chart to help you find it. Um, and to be clear, liberal here does not have the same valence it has in our typical discussions of politics. A liberal democracy, according to VDEM, is one that has all the basics of an electoral democracy, plus things like constraints on the executive, a commitment to the rule of law and individual rights. It's really just a way to designate a stronger, more robust form of democracy rather than a country that simply holds elections. In any event, this chart captured the U.S. in 2016 and compared it to the U.S. in 2006 to reveal a pretty stable democracy. The second chart is from the 2022 report, and we see that the United States is now flagged as a country undergoing autocratization. That is, the U.S. is becoming less democratic, and we're down to 29 on the rankings. 
This is just one report, of course, and big indicators like this should always be taken with a hefty grain of salt. But the reality of our present moment that we are living is that we are living in an era in which the legitimacy of democracy as a way of running the nation is being challenged in a way it hasn't for quite some time. And unfortunately, we're not alone in facing substantial challenges to democracy in our nation. Generally speaking, VDEM, all these graphics are from the 2022 VDEM report on democracy. Um, VDEM identifies a really significant uptick in the number of countries that have moved from democratic to autocratic, as well as a significant number of countries that are autocratizing. Um, as you can see, it is now the case that 70% of the world's population, that's 5.4 billion people, live under autocratic regimes, and only 13% live in liberal democracies. This is the lowest point we've been at since 1995. So this chart is very worrisome in no small part because autocratization is a difficult process to reverse. And I have up here a quote from the VDEM report that a recent analysis of all episodes of autocratization starting in democracies over the past century found that almost 80% of autocratization episodes lead to breakdown of democracy. Autocratization very rarely stops short of autocracy. So we are in a troubling place. So the next question might be, why are we in this bad place for democracy? And that's a really big question and one that goes far beyond this uh, big talk. But I want to flag a few things that VDEM has flagged as either signaling or coming along with autocratization in nations around the world when we think about autocratization. So the key indicators they identify are deterioration in freedom of expression, including the press, rule of law, quality of elections, freedom of association, high court independence, executive oversight, and autonomy of electoral management bodies, along with increases in toxic polarization, which they define as a pervasive polarization, both politically and socially, repression of civil society organizations, and misinformation. So in other words, when VDEM looks at countries that are autocratizing around the world, it sees a lot of these factors, right, when it's, when it's finding uh, this occurring. So with that political background in mind, we turn to our question for the evening, right, which is what role should the Supreme Court play in stabilizing democratic, and by democratic I mean small d, democracy, not democratic party, but democracy, democratic governance in the United States. The court is unelected, they're around for life, they make final, unreviewable decisions. None of that sounds very democratic on its face. But we also know that a commitment to the rule of law and judicial checks on the political branches are also key components of a successful democracy, just like the protection of some of these other key rights up here on the screen. So in the cases we're discussing today, do we see the court enhancing or shoring up democracy? Do we see it chipping away at democracy? Or is it merely a neutral umpire calling balls and strikes, right, in the famous language of Chief Justice Roberts? In other words, what is the court actually doing? And then also, what do we want it to be doing when it comes to ensuring a future for democracy in the United States? So I'm taking these as our background questions for today's talk and conversation and hope that you'll also ponder them as we talk about specific cases. So with the background set, let's shift gears to some actual recent decisions by the court. And for each one, I'm going to spend a moment explaining the factual background and the court decision before talking for a bit about how the case might help us understand um, the relationship between the court and democracy. And we're going to start with West Virginia v. EPA. The Environmental Protection Agency had proposed, but never implemented, and then actually decided to repeal, a rule it called the Clean Power Plan Rule. EPA is tasked with regulating power plants under the Clean Air Act, and one of the things it's required to do is to identify the best system of emission reduction, that's the statutory language, for old and new power plants. In the Clean Power Plan rule, EPA proposed rules that would shift the source of electricity generation from coal to clean energy. EPA was driven by concerns about climate change and making the rule and determined that the best system of emission reduction required more green energy and less fossil fuel generated energy. On the last day of the term, the Supreme Court struck down the never enacted rule because the court held that the rule violated the dictates of what it calls the major questions doctrine. And I'm going to explain what that means in just a moment. This opinion is really important for two reasons. First is the obvious policy impact for climate change. So even though EPA was not, in fact, trying to implement this particular rule, the Supreme Court went out of its way to tell EPA it would not permit it to implement this portion of the Clean Air Act by getting producers to shift the way energy is generated by moving from fossil fuels to green energy, which is going to hamstring EPA for future rulemaking and poses challenges to its ability to address climate change. 
Second, though, is this bigger question of the court's embrace of what it calls the major questions doctrine. This doctrine was explicitly employed in a majority opinion for the first time here in this case in West Virginia BEPA. And the major questions doctrine says essentially that if an issue is very important, an agency cannot act on it unless Congress explicitly told the agency it could act in this particular way. So in this case, for example, Congress had required EPA to implement the best system of emission reduction, and EPA decided best meant more green, less fossil fuels. The court decided that that was not okay because Congress needed to have been more specific when it wrote the Clean Air Act in the 1970s. Now, as Justice Kagan noted in her dissent, this is contrary to the way that Congress often writes statutes, including the Clean Air Act. When Congress used the word best, it assumed that EPA, which is full of scientists and other experts on clean air, would know better than it does what best means in practice. So Congress had made the policy decision that it cares about clean air and wanted EPA to regulate power plants to make sure we have clean air, but it also at the time recognized that a room full of elected politicians is probably less likely to understand how to get clean air than a building full of environmental scientists and environmental policy experts. Justice Kagan described this kind of delegation as something a, quote, rational Congress would do. By embracing the major questions doctrine, the court is a simultaneously weakening the ability of agencies and really of Congress to act while strengthening its own ability, the, court, the ability of the courts, that is, to jump into a policy debate and declare an issue to be a major question that requires judicial resolution. So more room for courts to intervene, less ability for agencies to respond to crises and other policy challenges, less ability for Congress to actually have its policy goals implemented. One final perplexing aspect of the embrace of the major questions doctrine that I'll flag is that it's ostensibly driven by a concern that agencies will be able to make really big decisions that Congress did not intend them to make kind of under the radar, right? To make policy that flies in the face of political will and accountability, do it kind of secretly. But if an issue is really a major question, if it's something that will cost a ton of money or is super controversial, which are some of the ways the court says we might be able to identify a major question, it seems even more likely that Congress and the public and the president will be engaged, right, and will be able to check the agency on this. So ironically, the court seems to be inserting itself into a policy domain in which secretive, uncontrollable bureaucratic action is, in fact, least likely to arise. Okay, so what does this case, West Virginia v. EPA, tell us about the court and democracy? Um, one is it tells us that the court is committed to a robust vision of its own role in governance alongside a very weak role for government agencies and, and a weekend role for Congress, I would say. It also tells us that the court is committed to a version of America in which the government does very little. And we see this articulated most boldly in the concurring opinion of Justice Gorsuch, which was joined by Alito. But the court itself is embracing a view of government that does little to address big problems. So from a democracy standpoint, this vision of a kind of do-nothing, close-to-absentee government poses real challenges to the legitimacy of our democratic government at this moment in history. Because if the government is unable to respond effectively to the most pressing challenges of the day, and I think we can all agree that we are faced with, faced with many pressing and complex challenges from climate change to international relations to income inequality, lots of things, it may lead to further autocratization as the public as voters start to wonder whether another way of governing might actually work better and actually get more things done. Okay. Next case, we're shifting gears here to away from agency regulations and climate change and toward elections, specifically the court's attempt to address the interaction between campaign finance rules and First Amendment rights of free speech. This case uh, came to the court after the 2018 Senate race between Ted Cruz and Beto O'Rourke. At the time, that campaign had been the most expensive Senate race in history, with over $125 million raised for the election. And it's worth noting that that record was immediately shattered in 2020, with several Senate races raising much more. The top raiser was the Ossoff-Purdue race in Georgia, which raised nearly $261 million uh, by both candidates. So lots and lots of money involved in these Senate races and in this one in particular. As you see on the screen, though, the question for the court is a pretty narrow one. Namely, was it permissible for the Federal Elections Commission, which is an independent regulatory agency designed to enforce campaign finance laws, 
to prohibit a campaign from using more than $250,000 in campaign funds raised after Election Day to pay back the personal loans of a candidate. So I want us to pause to think about how specific this rule is. It applies only to expenditures in excess of $250,000. It applies only to funds raised after Election Day. And it applies only to paying back the personal loans of the candidate. The court decided that that rule was not okay. Uh, the FEC rule was simply implementing language in the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, which if you're old like me, you may remember is the McCain-Feingold bill um, from 2002, which was a very big deal when it was passed. Um, so the FEC rule was unlike the West Virginia v. EPA case where the agency was interpreting language, and that was the question. Here, the, the agency was just implementing the, the clear language of the statute um, that prohibited this type of spending. But the court held that the rule burdened core speech because it discouraged candidates from loaning money to their campaigns. Specifically, the court held that the law penalized a candidate by imposing a, quote, significant risk that a candidate will not be repaid if he chooses to loan his campaign more than $250,000, end quote. So to be clear, the problem was not that the law regulated political speech at all. The government can, of course, limit free speech rights and does so all the time, right? Our rights are not unlimited or absolute. Famously, for example, we have no First Amendment right, right, to shout fire in a crowded movie theater. But if a regulation burdens First Amendment speech, it has to satisfy some requirements, one of which is that the government is pursuing a legitimate objective with the regulation. The court has struck down campaign finance laws in the past and in doing so has held that there is, quote, only one permissible ground for restricting political speech, the prevention of quid pro quo corruption or its appearance. Other objectives the government have might have, like reducing the amount of money in politics, leveling electoral opportunities by equalizing candidate resources, limiting the influence a contributor may have over an elected official. None of those are permissible, according to the court. Only quid pro quo corruption is legitimate. Now, the government had good reason to think it might win here because these were pretty good facts for regulating quid pro quo corruption. The ban was only on money collected after election day, that is after you knew who won. And it was only to repay the personal loans of the candidate themselves, but the court was not persuaded and the law failed because it was not pursuing that legitimate anti-corruption interest. Okay, so from a democracy standpoint, what is our takeaway here? First, this is yet another example of the court stopping an agency from acting just like it did in West Virginia v. EPA, but again, also invalidates part of a statute. So stripping power from two different branches of government in this decision, also to a famously bipartisan bill in our era of hyperpolarization, which is, I think, kind of interesting to think about. Um, yet it says that it's making these interventions to protect the individual rights of free expression contained in the First Amendment, which brings me to one additional point about the court and democratic erosion. Generally speaking, the global contemporary move toward autocracy is far less likely to occur via tanks and military coups, although actually 2021 saw a record number of actual coups in the um, recent years. But generally speaking, that's not how autocracy has been occurring. Instead, it's far more likely to happen via legal means. And there are many ways this can happen, but one is by using the language and ideals of liberal democracy, individual rights to free speech, for example, to undermine liberal democratic norms and institutions. Rosalind Dixon and David Landau have written about this process in other countries and describe it as what they call abusive constitutionalism. So in this case, using the language of liberal democratic rights to undermine the institutions of liberal democracy. Free speech and campaign finance laws seem to my mind like a good example of this type of abusive constitutionalism. The decisions in this line of cases are ostensibly designed to protect free expression, which is, of course, a crucial foundation of liberal democracy, but they come at the expense of more competitive and more fair elections, which is perhaps the most crucial foundation for any type of democracy. They also exacerbate inequality, which is often identified as another trigger of democratic erosion, because, of course, how many of us can afford to lend our own campaigns $250,000 of our own personal money? So this case and others like it are, I think, um, very important for considering the role of the court in democratic erosion and thinking about the role of kind of legal autocratization. Okay, our final case from the last term is Carson v. Macon. And this also raises question about the relationship between individual rights and our democratic order. 
Maine is a very rural state, and as such, it is not able to provide secondary schools to all teenagers in the state. Instead, it operates a tuition assistance program in which the state will provide a set amount of tuition assistance to help parents pay to send their kids either to a neighboring school district that has a public secondary school or to a private school. In order to receive the tuition assistance, private schools have to meet certain criteria. Most importantly, they have to be accredited. But they also had to be non-sectarian, meaning they couldn't be religious schools. And Maine defined a religious school not as one that was simply run by a religious group or met in a religious building, but a school that, quote, promotes the faith or belief system with which it is associated and or presents the material taught through the lens of this faith, end quote. The Supreme Court held that this requirement violated the First Amendment free exercise rights of the parents who challenged the law because it discriminated against parents who wanted to exercise their religious beliefs by sending their children to religious schools. So I think this case is most significant not so much for the case itself, but because it's part of a larger trend of cases on this court regarding religious freedom. So specifically, this case is one of several in which the court has been chipping away at establishment clause concerns about the government becoming entangled with religion and very substantially expanding the scope of the free exercise clause. In addition to the main case, you may recall reading about the case of a public high school football coach who led prayers on the 50-yard line after games. The opinion in that case is really even more far-reaching than this one and states several times that religious speech is, quote, doubly protected because it is protected by both the free exercise and the free speech clauses. So the concern is not that the court, or sorry, the concern is that the court is not protecting free exercise, but is instead privileging religious speech and exercise in ways that are actually harmful to a pluralistic democratic society. So in the football case, for example, Justice Sotomayor's dissent raised questions about the speech and free exercise rights of the student players who may have felt pressured to participate in a religious exercise with which they disagreed. In the Maine case, the state of Maine is now forced to send tax money to religious schools, which is something many Maine taxpayers may not want to subsidize, right? So like the last case, we see the court considering a claim of free expression, this time in the context of religious expression, and applying it in ways that seem to undermine liberal democratic norms about living in a pluralistic society. And we're not done uh, because we'll see more of this as we turn to our final cases uh, for this evening. For our last section of the talk this evening, we're going to shift gears to examine a few cases on the docket for the coming term. And we're going to look very quickly at the four cases you see up here on the screen. The first two cases, Moore v. Harper and Merrill v. Milligan, both involve elections law. The third case is about affirmative action. And the last is about the intersection of speech rights and public accommodations laws. Lots of big ticket items already on the docket next term. More to come, but we'll, we'll talk about what we have so far here. And we'll start with Moore v. Harper. Okay. Moore v. Harper comes to us out of North Carolina, and that states many, many battles over congressional redistricting. Um, states are required to draw new district lines for congressional and state legislative districts after each census to make sure that each district includes approximately the same number of people. Uh, uh, on, uh, sorry, on February 4th, 2022, the North Carolina Supreme Court held that the newly drawn maps violated the North Carolina state constitution, not the U.S. constitution, but the state constitution, because they were an unconstitutional partisan gerrymander. A partisan gerrymander refers to a situation in which a state legislature draws district lines for the primary purpose of ensuring that the maps will produce as many representatives as possible from the same party as the legislators drawing the maps. Um, the Supreme Court has decided that these claims are non-justiciable in federal courts, meaning that federal courts will refuse to hear these claims. But that decision has no bearing on whether a state court can hear that kind of a claim based on state law. And that's what happened in this case. So that's our brief background here. The reason this case is receiving a fair amount of attention is that it is premised on this theory called the independent state legislature theory, which argues that only, the, only state legislatures have any control over election law. This theory is premised on this language that we see um, before us from the Elections Clause of the Constitution. And that language, I'm just going to have to move my Zoom screen so I can read it for us, is that the times, place, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof, but the Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations 
except as to the place of choosing senators. Um, okay, so to be sure, the constitutional language says the legislature. So the question is, why is this a controversial theory if that's exactly what the Constitution says? And one big reason is that it has never in all 233 years of the Constitution's history been interpreted that way, so it would be a big change. Um, and that's because right now and for always, we have assumed that when the Constitution says the legislature, it refers to the normal lawmaking process in each state. So by the normal lawmaking process, we include things like review by state courts to make sure that the laws passed by the state legislature comply with the state's constitution and other laws. It would also include, for example, referenda passed by voters, vetoes by governors. None of those things are explicitly the legislature, but if the voters of a state passed a referenda or passed referenda or a referendum, my plurals and singulars correct there, uh, regarding elections, um, the way we have interpreted in the past that that would be completely permissible, right, and contemplated under the elections clause, right, because that's part of the normal lawmaking process in the state. Now, several justices on the court have expressed support for independent state legislature theory in previous dissents or concurrences, and those justices are Thomas Gorsuch, Alito, and then there's been some ambivalence from Kavanaugh, maybe curiosity about about the theory, but no no commitment one way or another from Kavanaugh, but some interest from him on it. Um, Barrett has not had the opportunity to weigh in yet. Um, so the concern is that embracing this theory could produce unfettered control of congressional elections, federal elections by state legislatures. So thinking about this from the standpoint of democratic erosion, which is what we're doing here tonight, we should be asking whether that's more or less likely to preserve democratic elections, right? Thinking about state legislators as having um, basically unfettered control, better or worse for democracy. But there is one check that we can see built into the system right here on the screen, and that's that Congress, right, has the right to override state laws on elections. And that's something that we will consider briefly at the end of our discussion tonight. Okay, I'm gonna move more quickly through these remaining cases, which are equally complex and interesting, but I think a bit easier to digest and explain than independent state legislature theory. Um, the first up here is Merrill v. Milligan. This is another case dealing with a challenge to a state's new congressional map, but this time the allegation is that the map is an illegal racial gerrymander as opposed to an illegal partisan gerrymander. It is set for oral argument on October 4th. A three-judge district court panel had held that the map illegally diluted the votes of black voters in Alabama and ordered the state to draw a new map. Back in February, the Supreme Court, on a five to four vote with uh, Chief Justice Roberts joining the liberals in dissent, halted the lower court order from going into effect, which had the effect of permitting that allegedly racially gerrymandered map to remain in force for the 2022 election. So the district court had ordered that the state redraw a new map. This was back in February for the, for the midterms. And um, back in February, the Supreme Court stopped it and said, no, we're going to permit that, um, that challenged map to go into effect. And again, that was a 5-4 um, vote. Okay, so this case is important because it addresses the ongoing significance of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which has taken on more significance in the wake of the court's invalidation of a different part of the Voting Rights Act back, to, back in its 2013 decision in Shelby County v. Holder. So Section 2 kind of feels like the last remaining pillar of the Voting Rights Act, at least as regards redistricting. So the court's decision here could be very important for the future of the Voting Rights Act. From a democracy perspective, um, the thing to watch for will be to see how the court weighs concerns about voting rights and racial vote dilution with states' rights um, and deference to the state legislature, because that's how the court has been framing a lot of these issues lately. Okay, our next case is Students for Fair Admission uh, v. Harvard and UNC. And as you heard in the introduction, I'm a UNC alum, so I will not pretend to be unbiased in, in recounting this one, the beautiful old well in Carolina Blue here on the left. Um, I have them consolidated up, up here on the screen, but they're actually going to be considered separately by the court, and that's because Justice Jackson just recently finished the term on the Board of Overseers for Harvard, so she's had to recuse herself from the Harvard case but can sit for the UNC case. 
Okay, but I have them combined because they're raising essentially the same issues for the court, and they were strategically chosen by the litigants because Harvard is the oldest private university and UNC is the oldest public university um, in the nation. So they're raising the same issue, but in a pr private and public context. Both cases are asking the court to overrule its 2000 three decision, Grutter v. Bollinger, that permitted universities to consider race as a factor in admissions to enhance the diversity of the student body. And so again, the distinction between public and private means the Harvard case is premised on Title VI and receiving federal funds, and the UNC case is premised on equal protection because it's a state university. The common thread in both cases, again, though, is that desire to overrule the court's 2003 precedent, permitting the consideration of race as a factor in higher ed. These cases are set for oral argument on Halloween. We talked about two elections cases before this one, which I think very clearly implicate democratic governance. But I, I think that the court's handling of this issue is also potentially significant here. Democracy has meant a lot of different things to different people at different moments in time, but one thing it always means is rule by the people. Affirmative action is one way that institutions have decided to try and address significant past discrimination in ways that are designed to create a more equal and just contemporary society. The universities in the case here argue that a diverse student body is one that is better prepared to self-govern and to meet the challenges of our global, diverse, and complicated 21st century. How the court responds to that, I think, is going to be another indicator of how it understands democratic governance in the present moment. Okay, this brings us to our final case, 303 Creative LLC v. Elinas. There is no date yet set for oral argument here. The issue I have up here for you on the screen is the way that the Supreme Court reframed the question presented by the petitioner for the case, and the way they reframed it is, does applying a public accommodation law to compel an artist to speak or stay silent, violate the free speech clause of the First Amendment. That is a little heavy on legalese, I think, so I'm going to summarize the facts very quickly to make the issue a bit more transparent. Lori Smith is our petitioner who owns 303 Creative. She's a graphic designer who designs websites and wants to start designing wedding websites. She does not want, however, to design wedding websites for gay couples because she believes her religious faith forbids her from condoning same-sex marriages. She lives in Colorado, which has an anti-discrimination law that forbids businesses that are open to the public from discriminating against gay people or announcing their intention to do so. This is what we call a public accommodations law. Ms. Smith says that the law compels her to speak views she does not support if she cannot refuse to serve gay customers. This case is significant in part because it seems like the court is going to take up the issue it dodged back in the masterpiece cake shop decision in 2018. You may recall that, that case also involved the Colorado anti-discrimination law. It also involved wedding vendors and gay marriage. Um, but the court issued its opinion in that case on very narrow grounds and didn't directly tackle the issue. Um, interestingly, the court decided only to hear whether the Colorado law impacts Ms. Smith's free speech rights. So the court is not going to be considering the interaction between her rights to religious free expression and the public accommodation law, it'll just be a speech right. But it is considering whether one person's view of another type of person can be a justifiable basis to keep people from receiving the same services everyone else receives. And spoiler alert, the Supreme Court rephrased the issue to make it seem like the answer is going to be yes. She is going to be allowed to refuse service. We'll have to wait and see, of course. But we're back to abuse of constitutionalism in this case because we see that the petitioner is using one key pillar of liberal democratic society, free expression, to impair the right to equal treatment that is another key pillar of liberal democratic society, right? Anti-pluralist policies that aim to codify discriminatory treatment have been a frequent and effective tactic of autocratizers around the world. So we should be attentive to how the court handles these claims. Okay, I thought I would conclude this evening with a few big picture observations on the court and democracy. Um, first, I suspect that this talk may have left some of you embracing some version of what I would call the Homer Simpson paradox. And that is, to paraphrase Homer's famous line, that the court is both the cause of and solution to all of our problems. But I would humbly disagree with that position and instead suggest that the Supreme Court is in fact neither the cause of nor the solution to all of our democratic woes. 
There's no question to my mind that we are currently dealing with an aggressive court that seeks to remake American law in a manner that more closely reflects the personal preferences of some of the justices and in ways that are far out of step with the majority of the American public. That last case we saw is a great example of that, right? So the court kind of um, decided that initial Colorado case on very narrow grounds, the court is eager to take it this round, right? So the court's taking a lot of cases that it has declined to take in years past because it seems to be eager to weigh in on contentious issues. But it is also true that the court has always been at least in part a reflection of the greater polity of which it is a part, always, for all time. The court is thus both a driver of our democratic challenges and a reflection of it, which leads to my second point, that political problems require political solutions. So we cannot save democracy only in the courts. We should, of course, be attentive to what the courts are doing and fight for democracy in the courts. When we think about that handful of countries that escaped autocracy even after heading down that path, remember 80% uh, end up going all the way into autocracy, but 20% don't. Um, and when they escape autocracy, it wasn't courts who stepped in and saved them, but it was politics and popular mobilization, right, of the polity that, um, that helps countries avoid autocracy, autocracy. So when we look at this list of autocratization indicators, and we think about the cases from the last term and the ones coming up, it's clear, at least to me, that the court is an exacerbator of our current democratic peril. But for better or worse, solutions to the challenges posed by the court are less likely to be found in legal briefs or expert panels than they are in politics and political organizing. Okay, that's all I have for the presentation. Thank you all for having me here, and I'm looking forward to, to chatting with everyone in the Q&A about this important topic. All right, so if you guys want to go ahead and type any questions you have in the chat, uh, also, I want to apologize. It also appears that Zoom itself is having some audio issues, so if everybody sounds a little low. It's a Zoom-based issue over which I have moderate, very tiny, a, a small modicum of control. So I did what I best I could, but I apologize. Um, this will be posted uh, on our YouTube channel, and I will boost the audio if it doesn't sound as loud as it should be. So I apologize to everyone with that. I don't know if anybody noticed me, but that's what I was furiously trying to research in the back, in the background there, um, since uh, several of you reported that um, there were difficulties with the audio. Um, okay, if, so yeah, so if you have any questions, feel free to place them in the chat. Um, one question that I had, which I thought about, which I was thinking about in the lead up to this, um, is that the court obviously is the only institution that is appointed for life and they get to decide when they want to retire and it seems that it was like it's intentionally designed to be a sea anchor on where we're going um is that an accurate like is that an accurate way to think about it because i know there's all these we get very charged about this but is the court's role in essence to kind of keep a break on where we go so we don't run too far in any one direction I, I think, well, I think that's typically how we think about the Senate, right? The Senate is, I can't, I think this was Lyndon Johnson's, that the the Senate, or no, it was Bob Carroll writing about Lyndon Johnson, but the Senate is the saucer, right, to the teacup, it cools, the hot tempered of the House of Representatives, right? So that kind of understanding the relationship between institutions in that way. Um, the court is supposed to be a stabilizing institution, right? When we think about the rule of law, um, it, and that's, we want the court to be, an institution that is consistent and predictable, right, to some to some very important degree. And that's an important indicator, right, of democratic um, stability. Um, I, I think, though, that um, when it comes to lifetime appointments, I would say that I would link less to kind of um, uh, small c conservatism and more to independence, right? I think that's the rationale of the lifetime appointments is that once you're appointed, you're not gonna worry about currying favor. And we certainly see that in other judicial systems where judges are much more kind of embedded in the political system, that they're much more easily and quickly attuned to specific party preferences, right? Acting on the will of their political benefactors. So the purpose of an of the lifetime appointments is an independent judiciary that can make decisions that are best for the rule of law and that comport with the constitution and that aren't worrying, um, the justices aren't worrying about whether or not they'll have a job in another week if they issue a particular decision, right? 
Yes, that, that is a Lyndon Johnson's quote is much more charitable than I think how we all think about the Senate now, which is, <laughs> I forgot, I think it was, I think it was Trevor Noah who said, where hope goes to die. Sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. so it could be. Uh, our next question comes from uh, Patty Black. Uh, and her question is, any advice for citizens on how to fight some of these regrettable decisions? Or is there anything you can do to push back against it? Well, I mean, a, a lot of these decisions, and, and I think um, that we talked about this a little bit at the end of the talk, but we can definitely say more about it, is that a lot of these decisions where the Supreme Court um, issues a ruling, there is a political recourse, right? So Congress could step in and actually change the law, right, to make it. So in the West Virginia v. EPA case, for example, um, I find that doctrine to be really problematic because I think the doctrine as employed is going to be one that is going to make it really hard for agencies to act in general. But on that specific issue of um, switching to, you know, green energy generation instead of coal fired generation, Congress could pass a bill and say, that's what we meant. That's what best emissions means this. It means more green, less coal, right? So there, there are many, and we, we see that in other examples here that we've talked about in other um, like kind of hot button issues uh, that the Supreme Court's uh, weighed in on. There are definitely ways in which there, the primary response should be to change the law, right? And to make the law better. There are other examples where that doesn't work as well, right? So the main taxpayer case, if you disagree with that case, the court uh, suggested several options, which were for, you know, for Maine to open up a high school in every county, but that's the whole point is that Maine can't do that because they don't have it. So there's not really a good alternative to some of these things. And that's where I think it's useful to think about historical precedent. And I think about the New Deal court, um, and we remember the, um, the switch in time that saved nine, right? Because uh, President Roosevelt was suggesting packing the court and this one justice on the court switched his vote and saved the New Deal and the court packing plan died. But the reality is that that justice had already decided to vote that way before court packing was proposed. But he had decided to vote that way after the results of the election that year, which were a like huge landslide for Roosevelt. I think he won all I think it was every state except Maine, actually, or maybe New Hampshire, but some some New England state, every state in the country except that he'd won. And I understand that to be that justice looking at America and thinking, well, what what is the role of the court in American democracy? And what do we want? What role do we want to play as an institution? So again, I think that the court is is always a product of our current political environment. And um, so I think there are a lot of ways to be engaged that are targeted to specific issues, but also to um, more general concerns about democracy right now. Okay, that actually ties in the court packing kind of ties into our next question, which comes from Lori Coffey. And she asks, changing the composition of the court, number of justices has often been floated, as you just mentioned, in, in uh, the, the court packing with under FDR. Is the likelihood of that, is there, e is there ever a chance that that could actually work and not just as like a political, el you know, like throw in an elbow to save the New Deal kind of way? Oh, you mean it actually be successful? Yeah, like could it, could it, could any president or even con or Congress, like could anyone propose this and actually turn it into, um, I mean, I, I think, I assume you would need a constitutional amendment, but would that, do you, do you foresee that ever being possible? I mean, I think that it would, um, I think it's certainly not possible now. And and I guess what I would encourage us to be thinking about is when we're thinking about responding to the present political moment, like that, that means um, responding in very kind of concrete ways to the issues and like the, the communities in which we're immersed and we're involved. Right. Um, and thinking about how to actually win things. Right. <laughs> um, so, so not, not just um, kind of really bit like, constitutional amendments or like really big kind of, but how do we actually make incremental changes and wins that again, I, I think the court is responsive to this larger kind of political context um, or could be. Um, and those kinds of things I think would be more effective. It, court packing right now, I think is um, dead in the water, but I think there's a question of whether we want it to be. And it, it seems very clearly to be a kind of um, mutually assured destruction type of scenario, right? Where 
this administration packs and the next packs, and then we have 30 people on the Supreme Court. Um, so I, I feel like it, it's not addressing the, the actual issue, though I, I am sympathetic to the frustration. Um, I'm going to come back to Patty's question um, and skip ahead to the next question, which comes from Sandra Lipkowitz, which is full disclosure. That's my mom. So hi, mom. Uh, <laughs> Uh, she asks, do you feel that the current justices are actually neutral and uh, not taking into account who put them on the court? Uh, I guess is what they're current, uh, the way they're acting out is that because they are, as you said, you know, actually just reflecting what they think the uh, kind of the feeling in the country is. Or do you think that they are being perhaps more partisan in their decisions than they actually uh, should be? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And I think... Um, so I think it's and my answer is a little complicated. I think I think that um, lower court judges um, are often acting in ways that are very mindful of who put them on the court because they have a desire to move up. But you can't move anywhere from the Supreme Court. And in my experience with federal judges, there is nothing that they like less than to be told what to do. So they are independent thinkers. They like to think on their own. So I don't understand the Supreme Court to be partisan in the way that I think we tend to think of justice as being partisan. I do think that they are deeply ideological. Um, so I think that, um, that they are making decisions that are driven by their own values and understandings of what is best for American society. Not all of them, but many of them, enough of them. Um, in ways that are really problematic from a from a rule of law perspective. But I, I would just distinguish that, I think, from partisan, maybe in the way that we see some lower court judges behaving. I think this is when you're on the Supreme Court, you're you're in charge. Right. So you're and you don't like to be told what to do. And you're thinking on your own. But I think many of these justices came into the court with ideological agendas. I mean, when um, Kavanaugh was nominated, he was nominated as a justice who would take down the administrative state. I mean, that was the purpose for nominating him. Justice Gorsuch, um, his mom famously ran the EPA um, under Reagan in ways that suggested she was not committed to the administrative state, right? So we have a long legacy and a lot of these people have very ideological commitments that they are enacting while they're on the court. But I would distinguish that a little bit from kind of currying favor with politicians because they don't need to curry favor with anybody. They're the Supreme Court. Awesome. All right. Going back to Patty's question. She asks, if the Dems can obtain a majority, is there anything they could do to change the court? Um, well, I think they should. I, I guess what I would want Congress to be doing is to be focused more on doing things and less focused on impediments raised by the court. Um, so I think if if Congress were actually successful and, um, and we've seen some legislative successes from Congress recently, right? But if there were more of that, more demonstration that Congress can get things done um, and more um, demonstration that democratic politics can work for most people in this country, um, I would be curious to see how important the court is in those discussions. Because what I would suspect is that the court should become less important right as Congress becomes more important. But right now, um, Congress has really um, taken a step back, you know, for uh, for a lot of reasons and has not been able to deliver on things that are really important. And that, I think, poses a lot of important challenges. All right, we have time for two more questions and we, we have two more questions. So Liguri, I'm gonna save your question for last. Um, uh, so the next question is for Christoph Colbrook, and he asks, can you explain the recent appointments where Obama was blocked and Trump's were not? I mean, that's obviously some partisan hackery there, I would imagine, in the in the uh, Mitch McConnell's very liberal interpretation of his powers there. Yeah, I'm, well, and I don't think there's anyone who would say that the Senate is not partisan when they're appointing and confirming people. I mean, that's that's un. Yes. I mean, that's just empirically true, right? I mean, we see that in the votes and how the votes have become more partisan, right? It used to be that Supreme Court judges were confirmed with um, supermajority votes, and now you're seeing with bare majority votes, you know, along party lines. So yes, absolutely. It was just partisan maneuvering, and there's no principled reason for what um, Senator McConnell did, but he wanted 
his people on the court and he got them. So that's the, that is the very simple explanation for that. Um, but but I think partisan maneuvering to get people on the court is different from partisanship once they're on the court um, is, is the distinction that I would make there. Do you, quick follow up. Do you think that that makes it more because the recent appointments have all been very hard fought politically and really close and, and riven right down the middle by it? Does that mean that the candidates are more likely to be ideologically extreme to one side or the other? Because that's the only way they can appeal to whomever the majorities is at the time. I, I think it is more a reflection of the fact that they are ideologically extreme than it is that they need to be ideologically extreme. Because I, I think if, um, I, I, re I really think if they were appointing, if the some of these candidates had close votes because they really are very ideologically extreme, there were good reasons for people to vote against um, a number of the candidates that are sitting on the court right now. Um, so if we, if we put up more kind of moderate candidates, um, more kind of, I think, maybe it wouldn't be so but uh, you know we're living in an I'm, I'm probably delusional we're living in an age of toxic polarization as we know yeah. um, so it might be that that we would get the same vote counts anyway um okay uh okay one more quick question and then Liguri's yours will, i'm going to leave yours for till the till the end um so the next question is from hamilton white and he asks uh what do you think about Alito's rationale and his majority opinion for nys new york state rnp versus bruin I, I have to admit yes. that I haven't read that one since it came out. It's been, it's been is that the hand, is that the hand, the, the concealed carry? Yeah, that's the Second Amendment case. And I'm sorry, okay. I did not review that one before tonight. OK, well, we will we will table that then for another time. Um, OK, and then so our final question for the evening is from Ligary Fernandez. And he asks um, and talk a little bit about the um, the difference between the original attempt I guess the strict constructionists who feel that the constitution is wholly written is not fungible and or open to interpretation uh, versus, you know, the, the needs of the present moment and how the court, uh, how that plays into how the court makes its decisions. Oh, should I to talk? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I think that's just, yeah. The question basically, I guess the question would be something like, um, you know, you know, with all the, I don't know. I guess how do they how do they rationalize that, or how do you think that's playing into how the court is interpreting? Um, well, I mean, you know, it's so. My view is that there's not a single justice ever who consistently adheres to one way of reading every case. I just don't think that's possible because some cases require different modes of analysis, and so I, I think it can be overstated when justices say, "Oh, I'm a blank. I'm an originalist. I'm a textualist. I'm a living constitutionalist." Well, it depends on the case, right? And different cases call for different kinds of methodology. I think, um, but certainly originalism um, is a way to constrain and limit what Congress can do, right? Um, and what agencies can do, and what everyone can do. Um, and we definitely see that from um, that kind of limiting language, using originalism to hamstring uh, the government. And we've seen it for decades um, from Justice Scalia up into um, the present day. And one of the consequences of that has been that I, I feel like I'm seeing more and more argument from liberals kind of employing originalism to make their arguments. Um, but then the, the kind of, you know, punchline is that they end up in you're uh, endorsing and kind of embracing originalism as a as a preferred way to do constitutional um, interpretation. So for example, independent state legislature theory, um, I've read an originalist, several originalist accounts for why that makes no sense. And that's no, that's, it's not how the framers thought about it. No one ever thought about it in that way. But I do think it's worth um, pausing to ask about um, trying to strike this balance between understanding that the Constitution is our governing document and we have to read the text of the Constitution. When I teach constitutional law, everyone reads every word of a Constitution over the course of the semester I teach it. I kind of consider myself a textualist because I read the text and I think we should implement it. But I also think words are complicated and often ambiguous and we have to figure out what they mean um, today for what, uh, for the, kind of taking these principles and thinking about what they mean in the 21st century and having a kind of originalist view freezes everything in time in ways that I think 
um, again, like West Virginia EPA, set us up for failure as a democratic polity because we need to live in a government that can respond to crises and challenges because otherwise people will go looking for something else. And that's what we're seeing around the world and it's what we're seeing in the United States right now. Um, so it's a real concern to be thinking about. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Professor Breen, for being here with us tonight. Thank you for that fantastic talk. And uh, I am going to hand it back over to Mary Beth, who's going to tell you about who else we have coming up in October and November for the rest of our 2022 season. So thank you again, Professor Breen. Thanks so much. And take away, Mary Beth. Many thanks to Jenny Breen for joining us here tonight and sharing her insights on the Supreme Court. Hope you can come again on October 13th for Dakota Matthews, the, molecu uh, the Molecular Lab Manager at SUNY ESF's American Chestnut Research and Restoration Project. His topic will be A Forest Reborn, Reviving the American Chestnut. He'll talk about the history of the remarkable American chestnut, which fell victim to a blight in the, earl in the early 1900s. He'll update us on the pioneering, pioneering work this project is doing to achieve the goal of growing 10,000 blight-resistant American chestnut trees over the next five years. Updates on our series can be found at our website, strathmorespeakers.com. Thank you all for joining us tonight, and we hope to see you again next month.